All right, let's get started. I will try and keep the lecture content simple and brief because I know that it's like it's like y'all have something else on your mind. <laughs> that is still ongoing, by the way. Um, and so, so there's that. Also, look. Does that have anything to do with anything? But I was looking at the schedule, and so those of you who are in steel design, which is, I think, like everybody, um, you all have a celebration coming up in an hour. Um, one of the things I was looking at was the schedule for both classes. So in here, you do have a homework due on Friday, but you don't have any more homework until after the exam in here. And as for steel design, um, I think that's the same because I don't assign the homework in steel design until the following Monday. So you know next weekend you got nothing to do for any of my classes except for study for this exam. But you're all, you don't have homework. Like, yay. So you're looking at me like, like what, what you want homework? <laughs> um, okay. All right, so one thing, hold on, I'm going to need somebody's help. I'm going to end class at 10.45, okay? I'm ending class at 10.45 to give everybody a break and give everybody time to get in here. Um, I'll tell you the same thing I'll tell everybody in steel design. I have the exam, and then I have the blank paper. And so just keep them stapled and turn them both in at the end. So, Okay, as for in here, um, just so everybody's aware, we have our exam next Wednesday. So next Monday, question time, next Wednesday, the exam, okay? Um, <coughs> homework, you have a homework due on Friday, so that means today is Q&A. Does anybody have any questions on the homework assignment that's due on Friday? You're like, man, we have, we <laughs> buddy, have you not figured it out by now? We're college students, Dr. Mike. It's like you've never been to college. The home? What's that? No, never. I've been defra I've been defrauding everybody this whole time. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. <laughs> you see, and he, and then you got this serious look on your face. See, you know, I'll tell you what. You can you can tell the seriousness by the hand movement. Because, or you can also tell the emotion by the hand movement. Because if you're talking about them and you're like this versus you're like this, you know, you can tell the emotion. You know, you can decipher it. Um, everybody good? Okay, all right. So I'm going to keep the lecture sort of light. Um, we're we're making good progress in terms of time. Um, one thing I will emphasize: um, this is not on the exam. What we're talking about today. Um, it's an extension of what we've talked about before, and if it makes you feel any better, not only is this not on exam one, it's also not on exam two, okay? So what I'm doing for this topic is this. We have two remaining topics in bending, and that's T-beams or flanged sections. I, I, I use the term flange sections because T-beams and L-beams are kind of the same thing, and you'll see what I mean uh, here in a little bit. Um, so uh, we have T-beams, and then we have doubly reinforced beams. So that's when you have steel on the top and on the bottom. But they're both bending-related topics. And I'm giving you a test on bending next week. So it's like, what am I going to do, put another bending topic on the second exam? I I'm not going to do that. And I didn't think it's appropriate to put it on exam one, because that's a lot of stuff on exam one. And I don't think it's right to just you know, take exam one and turn it into a midterm. I don't think that's fair either. So what I'm doing is this. Exam one is on homeworks one through four. Exam two is on homework six through seven. So homework five is just a homework. Just do it, you're done, move on. So I'm, I'm trying to make it a little easier on you. So moving forward. Everybody okay with that? Oh, that's good. So um, let me again iterate the, or reiterate the um, Engineering Career Day event. The Youth Social is tonight. Tomorrow night is, uh, or tomorrow, not night, tomorrow morning is the event. 
We really could use some help uh, at the Student Center. Um, if you don't mind showing up a little early, uh, we'd really appreciate it. So, the, the event like really starts at like 8.30, but we could use some folks here, honestly, like 7, 7.30 to help like stuff some name badges and things like that. Um, but it doesn't take a lot of work, but really all we need are some folks that don't mind hanging around um, for the morning and just carting some students around from workshop to workshop. It's just from 8 to noon, and I think we can probably swing you a lunch if you come, so, because we're feeding everybody, so. What, what? I, honestly, I would, if it was on Wednesday, I would, since I'm going to be involved, I'd cancel class. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have class, so. so. Um, everybody good? Okay, let's talk about T-beams. Let's talk about uh, uh, T-beam analysis and ultimately T-beam design. Um, okay, <coughs> so first off, I want to be clear as to what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is this. Um, so. What we've been doing up until now is we've been treating the beam and slab as if they're separate entities. You have a beam, and then you have a slab sitting on top of that beam. But if you remember that picture that I showed you from like the Third Avenue parking garage, y'all remember that? That, that? that wasn't really the case. What was going on is you had a, t a beam and a slab that were cast monolithically. It was one big unit. So you had a beam and a slab floor system that was all acting together. And so, you know, when you're analyzing the slab, you can design that, you know, as you would any other slab. But when we look at the beam, instead of looking at it as just a rectangular beam, we can look at it as a beam that has a cross section that looks like a T. So the idea is, if I was starting from scratch, if I had a floor system and I didn't have a clue what it would look like, what I would probably do is I would design the beam as a rectangular beam by itself. Then I would design the slab as a slab by itself. And then once I have a beam and I have a slab, what I would do is probably put them together and create a T-beam that looks something like this and see if I could tweak it and make it a little better. You know, see if you know, I could take those dimensions and go, okay, now this is what it's really going to look like. So can I, can I improve upon this design a bit? So right off the bat, I want to show you a, a little introduction and notation. So you've seen this symbol before here, this B sub W. Um, up until now, we really haven't had to differentiate between you know, what the width of the beam is because our beams were just rectangles. Well, <coughs> what I'm going to do is introduce two new terms uh, or two widths. I have this term here, B. B is going to be the out-to-out -out width of the beam. We're going to call that the effective flange width. So that's, from, that's the width of that top portion. And then B sub W is going to be the width of the web, the web being this, this uh, lower portion down here. Um, a couple other uh, parameters that are kind of important. Um, so you, do re you should recognize D, you know, and D is the same. It's from the top of the section to where the steel is at the bottom. Um, I also have a new term here, this H sub F. So H is typically a height. So the, the H dimension would be from here all the way to the very, very bottom. So this dimension from here to here, that would be H. Whereas H sub F is basically the thickness of the flange. You can also sort of think of it as the thickness of the slab. So what I've been trying to do over these past, you know, what is it, like eight or nine lectures, is I've been trying to slowly show you this notation. Like, I, I know that there are sometimes uh, some professors in concrete design, what they'll do is they'll say, okay, here's all the symbols you need to know. And there's like an H and F, a H sub F, a D, a B sub W, an AS, an AS prime. You're like, blah, 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 what's going on? There's just there's too much stuff, you know, to show me on day one. Instead, I like to sort of slowly feed you this information. So is everybody okay with the notation? Everybody okay with that? Okay. So H sub F is the thickness of the flange or the height of the flange. B sub W is the width of the web. If you ever wonder why they use the term B, because I, I think it stands for breadth, like the width, you know, breadth of the web. So, okay. Or base, that, that's, actually, that's, that's a good one as well. Okay. That's also, that's just as reasonable. Um, <coughs> here's the thing with T-beams, okay? Um, 
what ends up happening when you look at the way that T beams behave, remember sigma equals my over i, right? So the highest stresses are at the very, 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 very top, the tippy, tippy top, and the very, 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 very bottom. And that's true if you're looking at, you know, just a regular old beam. But in a three-dimensional system where you have, uh, here, let me go back, let me go back some. When you have a three-dimensional system and you have stresses not only going this way in and out of the screen, but this way across the screen, uh, it's a little more difficult than that. It's a little more funky. Um, what ends up happening if you look at the bending stresses is that the bending stresses start to decrease as you go away from the, 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 the stem or the beam. And I, think that the, I don't think that that's a really, really wild idea or a really crazy idea to understand. You know, if I'm standing on the beam, as I start looking farther and farther away, the effect of me standing on the beam is going to get less and less and less. Like if I'm standing right here, there's going to be a lot of effect on that beam right here. But as you start looking farther and farther away, the effect of my weight starts to diminish, right? And so one of the things that we have to ask is we have to ask if we're looking at a T-beam, so we have a floor system. I don't think this image does it the best justice. But I have a floor system that looks, let's say, like this. And so I, I, I drew it a little more exaggerated. So here's my floor system. And if I'm looking at this beam, how much of that slab do I cut out and say, OK, that's the T beam that I'm going to consider, that that's, that that's the, the section I'm going to consider. And so what, what, another way of, 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 of saying that is we're saying, OK, of that slab, how much of that slab is considered effective for transferring stresses to the beam? So we call that an effective flange width. Now, for those of you who are in senior design or for those of you who are interested in bridges, the, the calculus that we use for bridges is a lot easier. All we take is the tributary width. We just say halfway over and halfway over, and that's the, uh, the effective flange width. So for bridges, it's a really, really easy determination. We just say halfway over, halfway over, you're good. For buildings, however, because the scale is a little different, you know, for bridges, you're talking about beams that can be like six feet deep, you know, and... And, 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 and slabs that are 8 inches, 10 inches, maybe even 12 inches thick. So you, it's, it's not the same story as a building where the beam's only this deep and you can have a slab that's that thick. And so the, so the scale is a little different. So because of that, we're a little bit more um, uh, uh, prescriptive, if you will, on how we determine the effective flange width. The way that we determine the effective flange width is we use the following equation. So we calculate these three quantities and we take the minimum. Now, I've got a different equation for T-beams and L-beams. You're like, well, what the heck's an L-beam? Well, it's pretty simple. You know, here's, you know, in the middle of the floor, you have T-beams, right? Well, on the end of the floor, you'd have an L-beam, right? So the L-beams would be the ones on the end. The T-beams would be the ones in the middle. So what you'll do is you'll say, okay, I'm going to calculate the span length divided by 4, let's say for T-beams. I'm going to take BW plus 16 times the flange height. And keep in mind, these are all empirical expressions. And then I'm going to take the girder spacing. Whichever one of those values is the smallest, that's going to be the effective flange width. And so you're going to have the same thing in terms of L-beams. You're going to calculate L over 12, this, and the girder spacing. So one of the questions I always get right about this time is, is it possible that there's a sort of no man's land that you have, let's say, okay, here's the effective flange width for the L-beam. And so the question is, is there, a, like, is there a section of the slab that could possibly not be effective for this beam or that beam? The answer is yes, that is very possible, okay? Uh, and it can happen. Um, the question, though, when you start getting into these scenarios is not, does, is that slab effective in uh, transferring load to the beam? Because it's not. So it, it doesn't help you on a strength standpoint. The only thing you have to be aware of is, yeah, you might have a piece of slab here that's not effective for this beam or that beam, but these two slabs are, or these two beams are responsible for holding that up. So when you're computing loads, you still use the tributary width. When you're computing resistances, you use the effective flange width, and so there can be a distance, or it can be a difference. Does that make sense? 
Because I know that's a little, a little wild. Yes. You're saying like thin it up? Yeah. <coughs> well, I guess you could, but but I would say very rarely would that be a, a re, like a reasonable consideration. Here, here's why I say that. Okay, um, the easiest example I can think of is a structure something like a parking garage or, for instance, let's say a, let's say a Walmart, you know. The Walmart is going to be this big, right? And so you taking that material out, what you're saying is, well, I'm going to take the Walmart and make it this big. Well, the Walmart is going to be as big as the Walmart's going to be, just as the parking garage is going to be as big as the parking garage needs to be. So could you try and alter the dimensions to account for that? Well, I guess you could, but you're either doing one of two things. You're either adding, ultimately going to add a beam where you really might not need to. I mean, this is just what I'm talking about here is just a mathematical consideration you need to make. Um, so you, if you could add another beam, or you'd physically have to change the dimensions of the structure, and the architect and the client probably aren't going to be too happy with that. So all I'm saying is, is that when you compute the loads on the beam, use the tributary width. When you compute the resistance of the beam, use the effective flange width. So does that make sense? And they could be the same. And in bridges, they are. But in buildings, this is a, a little bit of an added complication that we sometimes have to deal with. The beam on the end. Oh, the length, however long the beam is. Well, like, like just the span length, like from support to support. Yeah. That's a good question. Everybody okay with that? The girder spacing, how far apart they're spaced. Don't worry, well, actually, we're going to have an example where we sort of go through all these parameters, like, explicitly so I, I won't I won't leave you hanging there now <coughs> in all honesty as uh, as somebody doing example uh, problems and, and, and things like that um, the effective flange width is a, a little wrinkle that I throw into the mix but it's it's really not difficult it's just it's plug and chug it's it's mathematically pretty easy that's easy this is where things get interesting okay so Let's ignore the slot here. Here, let's get this off the screen. All right, all right. Just, I, I want to walk through some some basic concrete design. Okay, so to help what the beam looks like and whatever's going on, let's just go through the the concepts, the ideas behind how you determine how strong a beam is. Like, how do you determine MN, the nominal moment capacity? Just from an idea standpoint, ignore the math. What do you do? You have to find A. What is A? A is how deep that stress block needs to be so that the amount of tensile force equals the amount of compressive force, right? So A is that magical number such that C equals T, right? And then once you get that, you sum moments to get M in, right? Okay, well with T-beams and flange sections in general, there's a complication that arises, okay? A could be right here, or it could be right there, right? So when I sum moments, determining that capacity, it, it can change, okay? Remember how with rectangular beams we had that stress block? Like we knew it was 0.85 FC prime deep, or, or, or uh, 0.85 FC prime into the beam, and it was like A deep and B wide, right? So the stress block was a rectangle. Well, with T-beams, it could be different, okay? So what we have here is a stress block where the, the stress block is in the flange, and so the stress block itself is a rectangle. Here, the stress block is not a rectangle. The, actual, the stress block looks like a T, right? We have some names for these. We call this a rectangular T-beam, and we call this a true T-beam, okay? And so the, the, the difference between the two is the shape of the stress block. What does the stress block look like once we've determined where A is such that C equals T? 
Does that make sense? And so the difference uh, it will actually determine how we perform the analysis. Because when it's all said and done, a rectangular T-beam, the capacity is ASFYD minus A over 2. It's the same formula that we used before, you know. Whereas here, we can't use ASFYD minus A over 2 because that equation assumes that the stress block is a rectangle. It's not. It's a T-shape. So we have to sort of split it up and, and handle it differently. Don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll walk through these um, explicitly. Anybody question? Yes. Well, first off, when it comes to fastening them together, like, like you're asking how do you connect the beam and the slab. I'm saying you don't. What I'm saying is... Uh, okay, okay, okay. I, I, I sort of see what you're saying. Um, it depends on what you're talking about. Well, what I... Uh, let me, let me try and, and answer that as, as best as possible because there's a, there's a, we got a couple issues that I want to dissect. So let, let's take your question. Okay. First off, we're not talking about with, with this you know, uh, technology or, or this process, we're not talking about connecting T-beam A to connecting T-beam B. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is this. So I'm saying that like erecting formwork so that the formwork looks like this, right? Putting, you know, dropping your steel in, you know, and laying your steel, and literally filling that whole thing up to like right here. So it's all one unit. It's all, like the whole floor system is one unit, is, is what I'm saying. Okay? Now that's in cast in place land. That's if you know you set your forms and just cast the whole thing together. Okay. Now what you're talking about is something that's a little different. You're talking about a precast element. Okay. So the easiest way to explain that is to go back to something I had up here. This is way back. Ah, here we go. I keep going back to this picture. Okay. <coughs> so this is a precast element, okay? So it, it, I don't really have the best um, image right here, but the way that these look is this is what's called a pre-topped double T. So there's actually a unit like this, a unit like this, and then right next to it, there's another one and so they just keep that was horrible but they just keep lifting those in now there's an anchorage detail there to tie those two together and then they cover the whole thing with a layer of concrete to create a, a you know, like a usually it's like either an epoxy coating or maybe some asphalt um, to, to tie the whole thing together but they come shipped to the site as precast units like this but it still sort of acts as a t-beam because you have a slab, and then you have a stem. Now, when you're dealing with precast land, because the geometry is a little more funky, like it's not a perfect 90 degree rectangle type thing, usually with those elements you can sort of look up the capacity. But even if you can look up the capacity, the capacity is generally computed using the same methods I'm talking about here. And so we'll, we'll talk about that, we'll get to that here in a second, yes. It depends. Some of them, uh, usually there's a little bit of a, a topping on top of it, sort of, sort of, you know, uh, create a continuous force. So, well, you don't, you don't really have to worry about sacrificial so much because, it, like, let me, let me clue everybody else in. In bridge engineering, when we um, have a slab in a bridge, we um, will, so to give you kind of an idea, we'll pour the slab, let's say it's eight and a half inches thick. 
but we assume that that top half an inch is going to wear away over time because of like snow plows and you know just wear and tear so that's you know when you go in and replace deck over and over again that some of that concrete is going to wear away we don't really have to worry about that so much in here because I think if it's a parking garage you're not going to have like snow inside the parking garage well yeah hopefully let's let's we got we got some snow coming no but you really don't have to worry about that as much However, usually you are going to place a little bit of an overlay to sort of join everything into one continuous floor system. So when this is all said and done, you might place like another inch of concrete or inch of asphalt or something like that on top to sort of join everything. And so that, that is common. It doesn't happen all the time, but, but it does happen, yeah. Reinforced, no, not not terribly. But they might place some fabric, like some welded wire fabric, just for thermal, but not like for strength. Like you're not going to have to place anything super super extensive. Now, that's a different story when we're talking about this, because this the structural element might need some reinforcement uh, in that area. These are good questions. I like this. Any questions? Any other? This is good stuff. <coughs> All right, I gotta go. Where was I? Okay, right here. What'd you say? 146 was that, and then here's the rectangular versus T beam. Here, that what? Yeah, for for our purposes here, we're assuming that this is all monolithic. Yeah, it's all one cohesive unit. So. In fact, um, there's, a, um, there's, there's sort of a, a research area in the world of bridge engineering that if you do have unit A and unit B, that you actually need to detail a, you know, a connection between this unit and this unit so that when you connect those using some sort of you know, concrete closure pour, you know, some rebar, however you, you know, loop that together, that when it's all said and done, that it has as much strength as a monolithic unit. And so that's a, that's a really sort of new area in bridge engineering. There's a new uh, product on the market called ultra high performance concrete. This stuff is like, it has like compressive strengths of like 22,000 PSI, like it's huge. It's also like $800 a yard or like $1,000 a yard. This stuff is expensive, but you're only, you're only using like a very small amount of it. So you'll have like this you know, massive, you'll have you know, bridge girder A and bridge girder B and you'll set them next to one another and then they'll have sort of these pieces of rebar sticking out and you'll just place this small little closure pour between the two to join them. But that concrete has to be so super strong so that when it's done, it acts as if it's monolithic. That's a little different because they were tying that together with post-tensioning. So there were cables running from segment to segment. So the, the, the easiest way I can explain that bridge is imagine if you had like a wire, like let, let's say you had a solid piece of wire and you just kept sticking beads on that wire and then, you know, tightened it up. And so that sort of tightened it together. Now in order to get it tight, you know, those cables have to see like two, three hundred kips. Well, they do. <laughs> yeah, that, they, that, there's a lot of load on those on those girders. So, everybody good? One of the things about pre-stressed concrete that's different than steel. So, you've heard me mention pre-stressed concrete before, where you, um, you know, for instance, you'll have a cable inside the the girder and you put tension on it to lock compression in the beam. One of the things about pre-stressed concrete is that they are essentially an active system. What that means is, is on day one, you have some force locked in that beam, but 10, 20, 30, 40 years from then, that force dissipates. I mean, imagine if I took a rubber band and I stretched it and I just set it there, locked it, stretched, then I came back 30 years later. It's not gonna look the same, right? 30 years, there's going to be a lot of things happen. The rubber band might get brittle, it might dry out, 
the force might dissipate, the rubber band might get weaker. Well, that's kind of happening in pre-stress land as well. Um, you put, you know, 300 kips on day one, 40, 50 years from now, that 300 kips might be 240 kips, might be 230 kips, because over time, it dissipates. It's like, what do you have to do to a guitar string every now and then? You have to tune it. So, so think, you applied attention to a guitar string, but after two, three weeks of playing it, it sags, it starts to get weak, right? That force dissipates, and so you have to induce more force into the guitar string to do that. Now, we don't have the option of inducing more force into a pre-stressed beam. All we can do is account for how much loss we're going to get in the design process. But yeah. Does that make sense? I talk about this stuff all day. All right. So <coughs> I have here a T-beam system, and we're going to compute the phi mn. This is not a design problem. This is an analysis problem, because I know everything about the beam. Uh, it's 4 KSI concrete. It's 60 KSI steel. Um, it's a 30-foot long beam. And what I have here is the clear distance between webs is 50 inches. Um, I'm going to try and uh, engage in some artwork here to try and draw out what this really looks like. So bear with me. And also, I'm going to try and um, going to try and disconnect this. Uh, this keyboard without messing up too many things. Oh no, this is what was happening in concrete design. Maybe it's this cable, I don't know. Okay, all right. So I left my notebook in here, give me one second. <coughs> Okay, so here's what this system really looks like. So bear with me. I'm going to do my best. Okay, and then we've got six bars. All right, and then this, this goes on sort of forever into the screen. So it sort of does this. Right? So we're talking about this system, you know, sort of extending into the screen forever. Now, a couple things that we know, we know that this dimension here, that is BW. Are you kidding me? Uh, yes. No, 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 no. That's, that's sort of the, a point of the problem. What is going on with my cable? I'm not, I'm, I'm going to be, all right, there we go. I'm going to be unhappy if it con continues to do this. All right, so let's, let's address that right now. That dimension is this right here. So I said that this is 50 inches. Okay, so let me ask you this. What is the girder spacing? The girder spacing being from the center of the beam to the center of the beam. If it's 50 inches from inside, it's 60, right? Because it's 50 and then we go out five and we go out five. So the girder spacing is 60 inches, okay? Now one of the things that I do when I write my S's is I'll do this. I'll do S, but then I'll put a little line on it. My S's look like fives, so I do that to sort of differentiate. 
Okay. Now, um, we know that this dimension here is HF. That's four inches. And it might seem a little repetitive, like, Dr. Mike, why the heck are you redrawing all this? It's right there. I'm doing this because there's actually something to be said about the act of writing out the H sub F equals four inches so that you'll remember what each of these symbols are. This dimension here goes to the center of the steel pattern. That is D. Okay. And we know that, let's say, the girder sort of stops there. We know that L equals 30 feet. Okay. Now, what we have to try and find out is we have to try and find out if we're looking at any random beam. Let's say we're looking at that beam right there, the one in the middle. Whenever we do T-beam analysis, we are essentially assuming that the beams go on forever, okay? Um, so, like the pattern of beams. Like, you know, we have a beam every 60 inches until the end of time. Um, or, so what we're trying to do is say, okay, for this beam, how much of that beam do we have to consider effective in transferring the load? Or, in other words, what is that width? What is this width right here? Well, for a T-beam, that width is the minimum of three quantities. It is BW plus 16 times the flange height. It is L divided by 4 or the girder spacing, whichever one governs. Now, one of the things you got to be careful of right now, and this is where you want, want to pay attention, what is the span length? It's 30, it's 30, you said it exactly right, it's 30 feet, but these dimensions here, this BW and HF are in inches. Okay, so if the span length is 30 feet, how many inches is that? Three sixty. So what I'm gonna do is say this is three hundred and sixty inches divided by four. This is ten inches plus sixteen times four inches, and this is sixty inches. So that eh, sorry, I forgot the minimum. So that one's ninety. Because 360 over 4, that's 90. This is 60. What is the, what's the middle one? <coughs> 84, or no, 74, right? Because 16 times 4 is 64, so, so yeah, 74. So this is 60 inches. So for this beam, the tributary width and the effective flange width were the same. But that might not be the case in another scenario. Sound good? All right. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to be nice that we're going to call it because I don't want to get too deep into this example. And, you know, oh, like we're going we're gonna to make this example, get really into it in five minutes and we're going to call it. So I'm not going to do that. Now. Let me say a couple things for those of you that are in steel design in about 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open the doors now, and I'll tell everybody this in steel design, but I'll tell you this now since we have the time. We are ending at 11.55, but we are ending at 11.55 because there's an exam right after in another class. So, so. All right, all right, that's all I got.